But this doctrine of election is not easy to accept. Some of you are feeling a little pain in your mind right now. This doctrine hurts a little. In fact, if I can make you feel a bit better, it is so painful that the only reason anybody believes in it is because it's in the Bible. We just wouldn't make it up. No man, no number of men, no committee would ever come up with this. We would never come up with the doctrine of eternal hell either because these are things that conflict with the dictates of the carnal mind. They are re repugnant to the sentiments of, uh, of the carnal heart. Look, I don't understand the Trinity. That doesn't mean it's not true. I can't comprehend the Trinity. I don't know what it means to be three persons and yet one. I can't comprehend the virgin birth. That's incomprehensible. I can't comprehend the character of Christ, His natures. There are so many things I can't understand. There are so many things that are incomprehensible to me, but I believe them because they're revealed in Scripture. And I don't even mind some tension here. I don't even mind the fact that the Bible also says, whosoever will. The Bible also says that Jesus wept over Jerusalem and said, you will not come to me that you might have life. You say, well, what is all that? That's simply saying that anybody who will come can come, and anybody who does come will be received. You say, how does that work together with election? I don't know. But aren't you comforted in the fact that I don't know? Because if my mind was like God's mind, that would be horrific. Like, there are so many things I don't know. If I ask you a very simple question, if I say to you, who wrote the book of Romans, what are you going to say? You can't even say that, can you? You see, I heard some feeble Paul, and then you're all of a sudden holding it up because you know that's not the complete answer, right? You say, well, the Holy Spirit wrote it. Well, was it Paul or the Holy Spirit? Well, it was both of them. Uh, well, what does that mean? Paul wrote a verse, the Holy Spirit wrote a verse, Paul wrote a verse, Holy Spirit. How do we understand that? You say, is every word out of the mind of Paul, every word out of the vocabulary of Paul, every word out of his uh, heart? Yeah, absolutely. But also every word came from the Holy Spirit. How, how can that be? That is uh, incomprehensible and inscrutable to me. Uh, I can ask you another question since you did so well on that one. <laughs> Was Jesus God or man? Yes. The right answer is yes. But you, how can He be 100% God and 100% man? You can't be 200% of something. How can He be all man and all God? That is beyond our comprehension. We, when we say 100% of something, that's it. But, but if you're fully man, then you can't be fully God. If you're fully God, you can't be fully man, yet He was. I mean, it just goes on and on like this. If I ask you another simple question, who lives your Christian life? What are you going to say? Come on, you got to do this every day. <laughs> Who lives your Christian life? You say, I do. Really? Really? You do? You say, no, I don't. <laughs> say, it's Christ who does it, so we're going to blame it all on Him? <laughs> I mean, we can't give you the credit and we can't give Him the blame, so we got a problem here. Well, there were the, you know, the pietists who said, uh, uh, I will beat my body and discipline myself, and I will live my Christian life. And then there were the quietists, you know, like the Quakers who said, let go and let go. And I just went into passive mode, you know. And the Keswick movement came out of that, and the crucified life, and all these kind of strange quietistic views. Who is it living your Christian life? You say, well, anything's wrong, it's me. Anything right, it's him. I mean, it's a, it's a mystery that's inconceivable. The Apostle Paul said this about that. He said, um, I am crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. See, he didn't know either. <laughs> you have a... John Murray said many years ago that in every major doctrine of the Bible there is an apparent paradox. There is an unresolved paradox that is transcendent. And this means God is God. And the fact that there are so many of those in the Scripture means the Scripture was not written by men. I know editors. They fix things like that. So because we believe 
that Jesus is God doesn't mean we don't believe He's man. Because we believe that He was born of a human mother does not mean we don't believe He was born of God. Because we must persevere in our faith doesn't mean we aren't secure. Because the Bible was written by human authors doesn't mean we don't believe it wasn't written by the Holy Spirit. Because we have to discipline ourselves to live the Christian life doesn't mean we don't believe that it's not Christ in us. And because we believe in the doctrine of election doesn't mean we don't believe in human responsibility. These are apparent paradoxes we can't resolve. But the danger is you destroy the truth and come up with some uh, rationalistic middle ground. That's dangerous. So the unmistakable teaching of Scripture is the doctrine of election. Even the foreknowledge, Peter talks about um, 1 Peter 1, foreknowledge, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. Look at that for just a minute. I'll finish this here and we'll, we'll pick the rest of it up next Sunday night. But in 1 Peter 1, verse 1. He says uh, that we are chosen, who are chosen, and then in verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God, they say, oh, that's it, that's the key right there, according to the foreknowledge of God. And immediately they'll say, what does that mean? That means that God knows what you're going to do, right, before you do it, foreknowledge. And God, way back in eternity past, because He knows everything that's going to happen, look down the annals of history and said, oh, I see what's going to happen at John MacArthur. He's going to be born into that Christian family, and uh -huh, he's going to hear the gospel, and he's going to believe the gospel, so I'm going to choose him. You think that's strange? That's what most Christians believe. That's what most Christians believe and teach. That this is like foresight about what people will do. Now, the problem with this is, how are these dead sinners going to resurrect themselves to do this, unaided by God? You answer that question. How are those who are totally depraved, totally blind, totally dead going to come to the place where they make the decision for salvation? How are they going to do that? Can't do it. Can the leopard change his spots? Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Neither can you do good who are evil. How's that going to happen? If God just looks down and sees who's going to make the decision, then His election is not based on His own free will. It's based on their merit, right? It's based on their merit. The good guys are going to choose me, and so I'm going to choose them. This has nothing to do with all those verses we read. Absolutely nothing to do with them. And by the way, it says we are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. But I want you to look at verse 20. Verse 19. What's the last word in verse 19? What is it? Christ. Okay. Christ, now watch this one, Christ, for He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Oh, we got a problem. If foreknowledge means that God looks ahead and sees what's going to happen in verse 2, then being foreknown must mean the same thing in verse 20, right? So does that mean that God looked down history and said, oh, look at that, Christ is going to give his life. Well, if he's going to do that, I'll, I'll make him the Savior. I mean, obviously foreknowledge can't mean that, because Jesus said He came not to do His own will but the will of the Father. That's why He is called Christ mine elect. So what does foreknowledge mean? It's prognosis. Prognosis. We get the word prognosis from it, using medical terms. It is a predetermined choice. 
It is a predetermined choice. Christ was foreknown. That is, He was known by God in the intimate sense as the Savior, the Redeemer, before the foundation of the world. It's talking about the intimate kind of knowing. Like it says in the Old Testament, Israel only have I known. Does that mean the Jews are the only people God knows about? No. It's the kind of knowing that you have in Genesis. Cain knew his wife, and she bore a son. That doesn't mean he knew her name. Doesn't mean he knew who she was. It means he had an intimate relationship with her, and out of it came a son. Jesus said this in John 10, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. He's talking about an intimate love relationship. The shock was that Mary was pregnant, and Joseph had never known her. We talk about that even today. We use this expression, carnal knowledge, meaning a sexual union, an intimate knowledge. What you have here in foreknowledge is a predetermined intimacy. Just as the Father had a predetermined relationship with the Son that would bring Him to be the sacrifice for sin, to shed His precious blood as a lamb unblemished and spotless, so the Father had a predetermined relationship with those whom He chose. Foreknowledge is a deliberate choice. One other passage seals that case, Acts 2.23, and I'll close with this promise. This is a lot to cover, Acts 2.23. This ends all discussion, if there is any left, on the subject of foreknowledge. Peter gets up in verse 22, and he preaches, Jesus, uh, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst. This man, verse 23, this Jesus, delivered up. They thought they, they thought they crucified Him. They thought it was their plan. No, no. This man delivered up by the predetermined plan and, what's the next phrase? For knowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put Him to death. You're guilty. You're culpable. You did it. You did it with your own will. But God had predetermined it would be done. It was set in His predetermined plan and foreknowledge. That is, to, to predetermine, to, to foreknow is not simply to have information about what's going to happen, but to predetermine it. So we understand then that the Bible is very clear on the doctrine of election. That raises the compelling question about why God did this. And that, that question is going to be answered next Sunday night in what I believe is the most compelling, the most powerful, the most sweeping understanding of redemption that is possible to know. And I think if you're with us next Sunday night, your mind will not only be satisfied, but your soul will be satisfied, and out of it will come a greater joy in your salvation than you've ever known. But we'll save that for next time. Let's pray. Father, we are thrilled with this glorious truth, thrilled, stunned, really, that You've chosen us. And we ask the question, why us? Why us? We thank You, O God, for Your gracious salvation. And we thank You that that salvation, even though we cannot comprehend it, is open to anyone who looks to Christ and believes in Him, whosoever will may come. How you harmonize that with your sovereign election is for you to understand and not for us. But we know Jesus weeps over those who will not come. We thank you on the one hand for those who have not embraced Christ. May you awaken their dead souls, give sight to their blind eyes. May they see Christ irresistibly before them and run to Him for salvation. We pray in His name. Amen. You've been listening to John MacArthur, Bible teacher with grace to you. For free access to all of John's lessons and a listing of study Bibles and books available for sale, visit grace to You's website at gty.org. And for details about the Masters University where John serves as president, go to masters.edu. 
John MacArthur and Grace to you reserve all copyright protection under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at gty.org, and it includes instructions for and limitations on duplicating this digital file.